are at Spink in London. I'm very grateful for their having made uh, this room available to us. Let's start with the uh, Michael Broom Memorial Lecture. And our speaker today is Joe Cribb, who needs no introduction to this group. He is the retired keeper of coins at the British Museum and now an adjunct professor at Hebei Normal University. And he will be speaking on coins in the Islamic world. I'm going to um, talk about Islamic coins. As those who know me will well know well that I am not an expert on Islamic coins. So I'm talking from a perspective of somebody looking into the world of Islamic coins as an outsider and looking particularly at how Islamic coins are designed. Um, and so I'm going to do a run through from the origins of Islamic coinage through to the present day and um, with something of a focus on, on design. First of all, <clears throat> I'm going to look at the origins of Islamic coinage. Um, the, when Islam began, um, the uh, currency in the area um, where Islam began um, was very little, but in contiguous areas, there were Byzantine and Sasanian coins being used. And um, in, in the Quran, there are two references to coins, one of which is to Byzantine coinage. Um, so the, the, there's a reference to the payment of a dinar in one, in one of the books of the Quran. And in another book, there's a reference to dirhams. Um, and the dirhams... Um, so the dirhams are the Sasanian coins and the dinars are Byzantine coins. So there was a f familiarity with coinage and probably merchants encountered coinage quite um, uh, frequently. So when, when the Arabs started to make their own coins, they were modelled on the coins that they were familiar with. And the... Coins were distinguished from the coins that they copied um, by the addition of um, a, an Arabic inscription, which stated that they were issued in the name of God. Um, and the, you can see that the, the gold coins um, just removed the crosses. The copper coins, some, some of them removed the crosses, some of them didn't, um, but they add the um, in the name of God, and the same with Sasanian coins, that uh, the Sasanian coins look exactly initially like Sasanian coins, but within the margin, um, this uh, statement of who's issuing the coins. And the gold coins um, extend the inscription in the name of God, um, to, to give the Islamic declaration of faith. Um, and it replaces the, the um, uh, sort of Greek, Greek Latin inscription of the Byzantine coins. Um, and the um, inscriptions are written in the, the script that was around right at the beginning of Islam, um, which is commonly known as Kufic, but its beginnings are before Kufic is properly established and in Birmingham recently they found a, a very early Quran and the, this is Bismillah written in two different places in that text the, the the statement that the coin is issued in the name of God the next step in the development of Islamic coinages was the um, replacement of the Byzantine and um, Sasanian designs with ones that were specifically um, related to, to the Islamic State. And so the, the pictures of emperors were replaced by pictures of the caliph. Um, and so the, the design is very similar to the original um, first designs, which name God, but the image is the standing caliph holding a sword, um, he's the protector of the faithful, so he's, he's shown as a warrior. 
Um, and on one issue of the um, silver coins, the, the caitiff is made to look like a Sasanian emperor, but you can see his sword um, across his chest. Um, and on the reverse, the symbol of, of the focus of prayer in, in, in the Islamic mosque. Um, and there's, there's a description of this um, event of the creation of Islamic coins um, in, in a later writer, Ibn Khaldun, um, the uh, sort of 13th, early 14th century um, Muslim writer. Um, and he, he says that coins were made um, officially by the Islamic State so that Muslims would have coins to use and that the uh, a, a, an impression was put on the coins that related to the ruler. Well, by his time, that would be the name of the ruler, but in, at this early point, it was an image of the um, head of the Islamic uh, community. And after, after a, few, a few more years, the, the caliph um, decided to replace all the imagery with just inscriptions. And the same denominations were still being used. The, the, the gold dinar and the co copper fals, which are Byzantine denominations, and then a silver dirham, which was the Sasanian denomination, um, but now with just inscriptions. And such coins were issued right across the Islamic world. So within a few decades of, of the beginning of Islam, um, the, the, the um, Muslim armies had conquered from um, the, the Indus Valley right across to, to um, Spain and uh, Morocco. Um, so um, it, it, the Islamic coins were, were now being issued right across the, this uh, territory. Um, which was controlled by the um, Umayyad Caliph, who was the head of the, of the state. And the coins that they issued um, re replaced the representations of the ruler with um, further declarations of faith. There's no mention of the ruler. Um, the um, inscriptions are broken up into the sort of declaration of faith and then quotations from the Quran and a statement that the coin was issued in the name of God um, and um, where it was made and when it was made. Um, and this sort of coin was, as I say, issued right across the uh, Islamic world. And again, Ibn Khaldun describes this transition. Um, by the Caliph Abdul Malik. Um, and so he, he, he's making coins to protect um, transactions in the Islamic world. Um, and he puts words rather than pictures on them. And Ibn Khaldun says it's, this is because the religious law forbade pictures. And the earlier coins show that uh, 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 the early Islam, it didn't forbid pictures, but as soon as the Islamic State was well established, this was brought in, the coins were now familiar to, the, to the, uh, their users, they didn't need to look like the old coins, they could look like new coins. Um, Ibn Khaldun says the inscriptions on them were written in concentric circles. Well, we've just seen they weren't written in, you know, some of it was in concentric circles and some of it was in, in a square in the middle. Um, but the coins that were around when Ibn Khaldun was writing did have concentric circles written on them, and you'll see one in a bit. Um, and he also says, you know, that, that it's the declaration of faith, says that the name of the caliphs on the coins, as you've seen, it's not, but it was later on. So from that beginning, um, I'm going to look at the way that the sort of the traditions that were established then and how they changed over time. And the, when, when the Umayyad Caliph was re, Caliphate was replaced by the Abbasid Caliphate, um, the denomination system 
was retained, um, but slight changes to the inscriptions. Um, and a bit of the Umayyad Caliphate lived on in Spain, but uh, everywhere else was under the control of the Abbasid Caliphs, apart from a few pockets of resistance in the east. And as the Abbasid Caliphate went on, gradually it lost its sort of central control and lots of local rulers who had, had been appointed by the Abbasid Caliphs um, or who had sort of grabbed territory away from them, started to issue their own coins and added their own names to them. Um, so the, all these different um, states um, from the Idrisids in, in Morocco to Ghaznavids in um, um, what's now Pakistan, um, the, they all started to issue these coins which added, you know, retained the, the um, Abbasid design, but added more information, sometimes adding an extra circular line with more quotations from the Quran or adding their own names to them. And you know, his um, example you know, shows, this shows the, the, the change that took place. So the um, early Abbasid coinage um, has, been the overall design's been retained, but the name of the caliph is now on the coin, and also the name of the local ruler. This is a Tahirid coin. Um, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. It's a, a Safarid coin. So it's a Safarid called Tahir. Um, and so, so the um, caliph is still acknowledged as the, as the central power of, of Islam, but the the power actually lies with this local ruler. Um, and much the same practice took place across the Islamic world. Um, and this um, putting of the name of the ruler on became part of a, of a sort of concept that um, in order to show that a ruler was in power, um, his name would be put on the coins. And this, this is a sort of term, um, seeker, which means to strike a coin, but it's, it, it becomes a sort of idea that when a ruler takes power, there's kutbah, which is that his name's mentioned in the prayers at the mosque, and seeker, that his name appears on the coins. And so, so we have the, um, this, this began with the Abbasids starting to put the caliph's name on, and then this was extended later on um, to, to Include the local ruler, and this continued for this sort of practice continued for a very long time. When the Mongols captured um, Baghdad from the Abbasid caliphs, the last the last of the caliphs, they issued coins that looked essentially like the the Abbasid coinage with the additional additions of names, and likewise the Turks as they moved westwards before the Mongols, they did much the same. Um, and there are, there are some exceptions to this. A, a, a quite an interesting one is what happened in what is now um, Pakistan. Initially, we had Umayyad dirhams and falses issued um, in, in southern Pakistan um, that look exactly like the coins that were being issued right across the Abbasid world. But then local rulers um, began to assert themselves and um, create their own designs. Um, so the coin at the bottom left is coin issued by the Emir of Multan. Um, and it still mentions God, it says for God, and then it has the name of the, uh, the local Emir. But on the other side, it's got an Indian inscription, which references the, the pig incarnation of, um, of the Indian god Vishnu. Um, and so it sort of seems to be mixing local religious beliefs with Islamic religious beliefs um, on the coins. A very strange situation, yes. The boar. The boar, yes. Well, a pig is a boar. A boar is a pig. <laughs> um, 
the designs of these coins gradually begin to, began to change. As, so the inscriptional types continued, but we start to see frames appearing. And um, again, Ibn Khaldun attributed this to, to the um, uh, Berber peoples who, who captured the uh, Western part of the Abbasid world. Um, so th this is the al Muwahids, and they issued coins with squares on them. And they also issued silver coins, which were square shaped. Um, and so Ibn Khaldun saw that as a sort of an innovation which came out of that. But um, it was all this idea of putting um, structure into the designs by framing things. Um, is already there in the um, Umayyad period. On it's not it's not very common, but uh, the Umayyad some local Umayyad um, copper coins introduce frames and you know uh, sort of geometric designs is very much part of Islamic art as we know it today. Um, and you can see traces of it right in the Umayyad period, but it doesn't really become widespread um, until the Turks arrive on the scene. Cut to the Turks coming out of Central Asia um, and conquering the eastern parts of the Islamic world and converting to, to Islam. Um, and you know, some of their early coins create the the, 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 the the circular inscription that was around the edge into a square to frame the central design. And then they start to put lots of different frames on, on into the designs. Um, and you know, if, you, if you look on online at Karakhan, there's a big lot of them on Zeno, you'll see a whole range of, of um, frames appearing. Um, and this also shows up in the Buyid coinage in Iran. So the Buyids weren't Turks, but um, you know whether this is an influence coming from the Turks or uh, just something that happened to happen at about the same time. And as the Turks ca captured more territory, you know they kept introducing these framing devices. And so by the time they got to the Mediterranean frames became a sort of standard feature of the coinage. Um, and the, a, a similar thing was going on in the East before the Muwahids introduced squares onto their coins. So the Fatimids started to change the structure of the design. Um, you know, init initially, they were just, you know, the, the, the peoples in, in the West were issuing coins that looked like Abbasid coins. Um, but they were introducing um, Shia design elements into their design. So the name of Ali, the, 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 the caliph who is seen as the, the sort of founder of the uh, Shia, um, his name starts to appear. And the Fatimids who, who were um, uh, Shia Ismailis um, started to, to create um, very uh, nice designs using structures that are not quite the same as the frames that the Turks were introducing. But so here's the concentric circles that Ibn Khaldun was referring to, and a very elegant design where the inscription is turned into a star formation. <clears throat> and this um, Further west, the, the, the Muwahids introducing a square into their design are part of a, um, a sort of movement of fundamentalists in, in the West who were very much coming out of African culture. And so the, the um, Almorabi Tun and the Al Muwahids creating, in, introducing new elements to the design um, uh, to, on, on their coins. Um, and so, you know, sort of frames, as I said, starts with, there are a few Umayyad coins, um, but it really becomes um, a, a, a sort of design feature that is spread by the Turks, um, but also 
fundamentalists in the East also introducing uh, um, new designs. So it's sort of people who are culturally not the core Arab um, population of early Islam. Um, and this fashion for frames also came into the Abbasid Caliphate, so that some, some of the last coins issued by the Abbasid Caliphs before they were conquered by the Mongols um, have frames around the inscriptions. Um, and the, some, of the, some of these fra framing devices had tra traveled over long distances um, because particularly coming out of um, North Africa was a huge supply of gold coming from West Africa. And so this um, uh, design on the Al um, Muayyid coinage um, shows up in, in Afghanistan. The, the, the um, early Af uh, Ghaznavid rulers issue coins that look, you know, until you've read the inscription, they look a bit like the coins from Spain and Morocco, um, but um, uh, with, with, with novel, uh, with, with diff different inscriptions. And uh, it, the Fatimid coins, even you know, the, again, the tr gold travels. Um, the the uh, Mongols in in Central Asia, in in um, in uh, Western China, used um, designs that were taken from the Fatimid coinage and then adapted them in their own way. Um, so, so the movement of of gold helped the movement of, of coin designs. And once frames became widespread, lots of different frames were, were used on, on coins. So here, coins from Yemen, coins from Iran, um, coins <clears throat> from Turkey, Egypt, um, and coming down into the modern period, the Ottomans and um, the, the uh, Sharifs of Morocco. Um, so fra sort of framing, the framing of inscriptions became a, a, a very widespread practice in Islamic coinage. And we get some uh, quite spectacular designs appearing. Um, so coin of the Safavids in, in Iran, um, a very nice design of the Timurids with bits of the inscription enclosed in circles and a lovely arabesque design framing the coins, the inscription on coins of the Khans of Kokandi, Tajikistan. And India also had its share of framing devices um, and such frames uh, even reached as far as the uh, is Islamic Sultanates in, in uh, uh, Indonesia. Um, and Malaysia. Okay, and as we saw with the uh, Amwahid, the, um, the frame was used to create the shape of the coin and from, from India and Iran and also from um, it, uh, Malaysia and uh, Western China, we get um, similar sorts of treatments so that the coins adopt the shape of the frame that uh, encloses the inscription. One, one of the sort of most important features of Islamic art is, is calligraphy, and that one can also trace the changes um, that took place in, in calligraphy. The, the original coins, as I said at the beginning, the inscriptions are written in a script that's commonly known as Kufic. Um, and that Kufic survived for several centuries as, as the sort of main um, form of writing inscriptions. Um, but over time it became elaborated. So, so we have um, uh, what uh, is normally referred to as ornamental cufix. So they take the basic shape and then add um, arabesques and um, serifs, etc., to to the inscription. And 
um, particularly in Iran and um, Iraq, one gets um, a form of Kufic that is written in squares. Um, and you know, so all, all the letters are given a squarish form and quite often the, the whole inscription we've written in a square. Um, as the, um, again, the, the, uh, the Turks and the Mongols started to issue coins, um, they, as well as copying the Kufic inscriptions or elaborating on them with ornamental Kufic, they also started to introduce the sort of scripts that were being used in normal handwriting. So um, there are um, a, a variety of different scripts, uh, Nashki, Tulunt, uh, um, Nastalik, and they're all um, uh, sort of elaborations created by scribes to, 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 to write Arabic more quickly. And it becomes something that's uh, like the ornamental Kufic becomes very decorative. So, so we have um, a form of script where all the verticals become a pattern. Um, and uh, particularly on Persian coin, Iranian coins and on um, coins from South Asia, we see um, this very um, loose script, which is done um, sort of quite often in a sort of swinging direction um, and um, surrounded by little floral motifs to, to fill up spaces. Um, and some be very beautiful designs are created um, in this way. This is a, a large silver coin from Iran. Um, and you can see the, the sweeping gesture of the calligraphy and also the, the uh, ornamentation that uh, goes along with it. Um, in, in the Ottoman uh, Empire, the, there was a, a, a version of calligraphy where the, the Sultan's signature was turned into a, um, a sort of monogram. So all the letters were joined together into a, into a mass. Um, and this is known as the Tugra. And um, the, the Khans of Krim doing the same, but Khans of Krim were sort of a, an offshoot of the Ottoman, sort of next to the Ottoman Empire, but it also is used on coins in the 20th century in Hyderabad in Southern India, and also um, in North Africa. Um, and this, this coin uses a, a, a sort of elaborated version which is a bit like the square Kufic um, to create a, a, a sort of monumental design. Um, occasionally one sees um, other languages appearing and so the, the, the top two coins are um, coins issued by the Mongols in Iran and it has both ornamental Kufic and a cursive script on it. Um, and it also has um, Mongol script, um, which is normally written like that, and a script called Fagspa, which was invented by a Tibetan monk so that the uh, Mongol emperors, both in China and Iran, could write all the languages that they encountered in one script. So it's, it's sort of based on Tibetan, but sort of elaborates it. And the Mongols in, in uh, Central Asia, even incorporated a Chinese character into to one of their coin designs. Um, the character says tax, which is quite an interesting uh, comment. Pictures, well, as I said, when, when Ibn, Ibn Khaldun described the transition from uh, sort of uh, recreated Byzantine and Sasanian designs with the caliph into a purely inscriptional design, he says, this is because images were not uh, allowed in according to, to Islamic Islam. But um, there are quite a lot of images on Islamic coins. And um, you know, we've, we've already seen the, the ones that sort of adapt the Byzantine design into the Caliph. Um, but from Iran, there are quite a lot of um, uh, copper coins with 
strange designs. So, so here's one based on a, a Sasanian design showing the, the uh, a, a Sasanian god on the back. Um, and from the, the, the heartland of, of the Umayyads, we also have coins with pictures of elephants, fish, and from Jerusalem, we even have one with the Jewish candelabra. Um, so early on, there wasn't a, a complete ban of pictures. Um, and there's some quite interesting um, different images from that period, from the early period. So, so we have coins, you know, we already saw the coin with the the gold coin with the caliph, and here's, here's a, a sculpture uh, from from Palestine with um, such such an image on it, um, and from uh, Iran, and from when as as the transition from Sasanian designs to to Arab designs is going on, um, the fire altar of the Sasanian coins replaced by a picture of a of a praying figure um, with two, two companions. Um, this is normally thought to, to represent the um, caliph. Um, and from Iran, we have a bearded man's face. You know, is this the caliph or is it actually a representation of Muhammad? The, who's to know? And then um, a, a praying figure and an angel. You know, it's, a, it's a bit messed up, but it's, uh, you can see the wings of the angel. And then from Afghanistan, a very curious coin, which looks like it's got you know, a, 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 the head of a ruler who is sort of based on the Sasanian design, but has a different um, he headdress. You know, is it the caliph or is it the local um, governor? And the same figure is, stand, is shown standing, holding a spear on the, on the reverse. Um, the, the Turks um, started issuing coins before they became Muslims, and in in the the, you know, the, the um, Turks in Afghanistan issued coins with a variety. Of, first of all, with Sasanian designs, and then they created their own design, which has um, a horseman and a bull. The bull is has the the mark of Shiva on the reverse, so it's it's the uh, the bull of Shiva. Um, and when, when they started to, to convert, you start to see um, Islamic inscriptions appear. Um, there's also a very strange coin, uh, it's, which has the same design, but is issued by the Abbasid Caliph. Um, it's, I'm very unclear as to why um, this coin exists, but it does. And then those same designs then were reused by, by other Turkish dynasties. So the Khwarezm Shahs issuing coins like it. Um, and that, this design became very widespread and the early sultans of Delhi issued similar coins. Um, the Turks in, in um, Central Asia, the Karakhanids, the first big sort of Turkish dynasty to convert to Islam, um, also added images, so a, a, a feline on one coin. You know, the coin dealers describe it as a snow leopard. You know, I suppose it's got spots, so it probably is some sort of leopard, but difficult to know exactly what it represents. But the, the hair um, with a star next to it is the symbol of the moon. So this is sort of an astrological um, symbol appearing. And further west, the Turks copied again. You know, to look back to coins issued by the by the Byzantines and the Christian states that uh, sort of took over bits of the Byzantine Empire um, and copied their coins. So here we have Saint George, and then an early Seljuk Sabrum coins showing again Saint George um, killing a dragon, and then. Subsequently, this is turned into the Turkish ruler in, in place of um, St. George. Um, and we even have Turkish coins that show um, the, again, St. George and the um, Byzantine emperor standing either side of a cross on that coin. So they're, they're sort of taking inspiration from 
the coins they encountered to create their own designs. And the Arta kids went even one further than that. They copied old coins. So we have copies of Sas Sasanian coins, Roman coins, um, Greek coins, and uh, uh, late Roman coins um, appearing on um, their coins. So the, the one side is, is sort of fairly standard Islamic coin design, but the other side inspired by ancient coins. And they also as I said the hair representing the moon. We also see astrological designs on, on the, these um, uh, coins issued by Turks. So the Artikids, the Seljuks, the Ayyubids and the Mamluks showing um, designs that, are, that relate to um, astrological uh, symbolism and um, also the, the Mongols in Iran. So again, we have the hair and they're accompanied by the picture of the moon, um, Taurus, Sagittarius, and this is um, believed to be a, a, an Im imagery representing Mars. And of course, the, the very famous um, zodiac coins of the Mughals, um, which were issued with a um, zodiac sign representing the month in which they were issued and even at mecca you see pictures on coins this is a early 19th century coin issued by the local um, ruler in mecca um, with a bird and a fish and of course again the moguls um, using portraits um, on their coins and the uh, Shahs of Iran um, with, with um, their own portraits and um, modern Arab rulers as well, um, such as Mr. Gaddafi, the late Mr. Gaddafi. And this, um, what, what Gaddafi was doing was copying elements of Western coin design and, and most Islamic states now issuing coins are, are doing much the same thing. They still retain um, Arabic writing, but with representations of, of themselves, as in the case of Jordan, or of symbols of their state that are pictorial. Um, and uh, you know, so, so the, um, the, tr the tradition of, of um, Islamic coinage has been sort of influenced by Western coin design in this way. And so when ISIS decided that they were going to issue coins, um, and as, as the rulers of the new caliphates, they had to issue coins to, to establish their, their sovereignty. And um, difficult to know, but it was, they, they were made somewhere in Turkey, um, and like the other Islamic states, they, there's, there's a sort of Western influence going on. You know, there, there are no um, sort of living creatures, but um, e emblems of, of uh, you know, so the, so the, um, the designs uh, on the silver coins, you know, two of them relate to, to particular places in the Islamic world. Um, and, uh, the, coin, the coins refer to their, uh, their role. They issue coins with the same denominations as, as the um, Umayyads and the Abbasids, uh, dinars, dirhams, and, and falus. Um, and there are other movements that, so this is, this is um, uh, a um, sp Spanish man who converted to Islam and then started promoting the idea that it was, it un-Islamic to use Western coins. So people should use um, coins that were specifically Islamic and started and persuaded some countries to, to produce Islamic um, coins um, that could be used for paying the, the, the um, sort of traditional um, uh, donation that uh, Arabs pay um, for charity. And the um, 
the, the, the even one made in <coughs> Abu Dhabi, um, which is very specifically aimed at Muslims in England and, and Scotland. And it says, let the marketplace be free of unjust taxes. <laughs> um, so it's a sort of uh, um, an idea that uh, Muslims should only use Islamic coins. And just recently, this has been spread out to the cryptocurrency as well. So now, now um, they, somebody has produced a cryptocurrency that, it, that is um, uh, acceptable to Muslims and follows um, Muslims. So, uh, so the, 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 um, the current that, that led Abdul Malik to put Islamic inscriptions on the coins instead of images um, that sort of feeling about money is still alive um, and that pe people need to use Muslim money, not, um, not foreign money. No. And so this is, this is you know, what, what I hope that I've given you some impression of is that the, the, the place of his inscriptional designs has, has sort of created a a, a unity for Islamic coinage um, from east to west and through, you know, from the from the time of Muhammad down to the present day. But the, the this these this idea has been gradually transformed, particularly by um, the um, sort of non-Sunni communities in the in the in the west, and also by the Turks and Mongols coming in uh, from the east. Um, which has sort of introduced new visual ideas. And more recently, um, as with every other part of the world, European currency and European ideas about what money should look like have, have infiltrated um, and uh, uh, changed those traditions. And at that point, I will stop. Well, thank you very much, Joe, and let's give him a... It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure.